Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimize your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Hi guys, thanks for coming. Uh, it's another talk in the Vaccination Database Seminar Series. We're super excited today to have Gudar Morley. Um, he is the project lead of, of Debezium uh, at Red Hat, and he's in Germany. So we appreciate him being uh, <laughs> sitting up late with us. So as always, if you have any questions for Gunnar as he gives the talk, please unmute yourself and say who you are and ask a question. And feel free to do this anytime because we want him to make it feel like he's giving a talk us with us on campus rather than doing it over Zoom. So Gunnar, with that, with that, the floor is yours. Thank you so, so much for being here. All right, Andy, thank you so much for having me. Thanks everybody for joining. Yes, yeah, so for me, it's 9.30 in the evening. Um, I hope I can, uh, you know, hold up, uh, but it should be fine. I had plenty of coffee during the day. And um, yeah, so thanks for having me for the talk about open source change data capture with Debezium. And I want to talk to you essentially about three things um, today. So I would like to tell you a little bit, well, what change data capture is first of all, and in particular, why many of our users are so excited about it. So what is the use or what are the use cases for it? Why you would like to use CDC? Secondly, I will talk a little bit to what is Debezium as one particular open source implementation of change data capture or CDC for short. And lastly, and I guess that might be the most interesting part for folks here is some of the challenges we encountered while implementing Debezium. So, I mean, I believe usually in this talk series, you talk about databases and the implementation specifics of those. Um, so now Debezium isn't a database by itself, but I thought maybe I can try and make some points which uh, folks like you, if you create a database in the future, should consider to um, imp uh, to make the implementation of CDC easier. So what uh, could database architects do to make the lives of guys like me a bit easier in the future? So I hope I can bring across those points a little bit. Um, a few words about myself. So as um, Andy was mentioning, I am a software engineer. I work for Red Hat, which is the main sponsor of um, Debezium. So obviously I contribute quite a bit around that project. There's a few other efforts which I've been doing. Um, I've been contributing to Hibernate. I'm not sure whether I can say that in this call or people freak out. So <laughs> I've done you, it's, it's, it's real. It's not like it's like... You know, it's not like a fake thing or like, you know. No, 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 it's it's real, it's very popular still. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a bit my past. Um, I've been doing quite a few other things. Uh, maybe you've heard about Quarkus, which is a modern stack for implementing cloud native microservices. I've been the spec lead for Bean Validation 2.0, which is a spec in the Java space for putting constraints to your Java object model and quite a few other things. And as any of us asking, what is a Java champion? So it's a program set up by Oracle to recognize people uh, which are very active in the Java community. And I happen to be one of those. And if you would like to know what I'm up to, I suggest you follow myself on Twitter. If you've got any questions, you can reach out to me and I will be very happy um, to answer any questions as good as I can, either here today or um, later on on Twitter. All right, so then let's get uh, right into it. And let's first of all discuss a little bit what is um, change data capture and how does the museum fits into the picture there. And really the idea is quite simple. So as you all know, in your database, you have what's called a transaction log, right? Where, it's, where it depends all the changes which happen to your data. So for each insert for each update for each delete, there will be an event within the transaction log, which is used usually for transaction um, recovery or for replication amongst uh, different database nodes. But in our case, what we do is we capture the changes from that log and we propagate them as events to any kinds of downstream consumers. And why are we doing that? Well, this allows essentially to take the data from your operational database typically over to other systems where you would like to have the data and process the data. So for instance, very often people would like to take, to take data um, from the operational system over to a search index in Elasticsearch. And of course, this all should happen with a very low latency, right? You would like to have your full text search 
query results from Elasticsearch or OpenSearch, um, they should be very fresh. They should be up to date. So you don't want to do this in a batch way, which you maybe run once per day. But instead, whenever something changes in your database, you would like to update that search index as quickly as you can. And this is exactly what um, Change Data Capture and DBZoom allow you to do. So to give you some realistic number, um, we can react to changes. Um, it depends a little bit on the particular database, but we can react to changes in tens or maybe hundreds of milliseconds. And you could have such an end-to-end -end latency from your primary database over to some secondary system, maybe within two seconds or even less, maybe one second. So really you're, I mean, I cannot use the term real time, right? Because we have specific semantics associated to that, but I would say we have very low latency. So we want to take the data from, a pro um, from an operational database over to something like a search index or something like cache, maybe a data uh, warehouse, um, so some sort of OLAP system. And this is, um, for instance, one use case which I see a lot coming up more and more lately. So we have systems like Apache Pino, which um, try to do user-facing analytics. So unlike in the past where people only would go, uh, you know, for once of queries to the analytic systems, nowadays we actually can think about user-facing analytics and maybe have dashboards which are shown to our end users and which are driven by some sort of OLAP system. And again, of course, the data in the OLAP system needs to be very fresh, very up to date. And such a CDC pipeline lets you do this. So that's why we would like to do this. And now you, on this picture, you also see a little bit uh, how Division goes about implementing this. So we have on the left-hand side, our source databases. And now there's what we call a connector for each of those databases. So there's a Debezium Postgres connector, there's a Debezium MySQL connector, and so on. And they essentially tap into a transaction log using whatever APIs, formats, and so on we get by a particular database, extract those changes, and send them over to those consumers. And now we could... Uh, think about directly hooking up something like Elasticsearch with a Debezium. So we could just take the data and send it straight to Elasticsearch or straight to Apache Pino. But most of the times, people like to put something in between like um, Apache Kafka as a distributed commit log. The reason is, well, this just increases the optionality which we have here. So for instance, with Apache Kafka in the middle there, which by the way has very nice scale out characteristics, we can, for instance, uh, setting up, set up multiple consumers. Um, so we can one we can react to one change event into and in, in, in multiple times, and we can take the data and write it to Elasticsearch and Pino or and our search uh, our cache, for instance. So um, it's just more flexible. Also, depending on how long we keep the data in Kafka, we could, for instance, think about setting up new consumers down the road. So we can keep data in Kafka as long as we want. And well, as long as disk space is there, right? But uh, this means once we have those uh, log of changes in Kafka, we can enable more use cases down the road, which you might not, might not have had in mind when you set up that source connector initially. So that's why we typically have Kafka here. And then there's this other thing which is called Kafka Connect. So Kafka Connect is essentially a runtime and a framework for implementing such connectors. So essentially, Debezium is a set of Kafka Connect source connectors, which take data out of the database and put it into Kafka. And then you have sync connectors, which take data out of Kafka and write the data into some sort of external um, sync system. And the, ni the nice thing about this is this all is set up by means of configuration. So typically, Debezium users, they are not programmers necessarily. They can be data analysts or people who are maybe a bit tech savvy, but they just can set up such a pipeline by configuring it. They don't have to program. So that's Debezium in a nutshell and change their capture in a nutshell. So what else can we do with that? And the way I like to think about this really, it's uh, essentially liberation for your data. So instead uh, of you having to go and query for change data, it comes to you with this very low latency. And this lets you just do so many nice things. So we have spoken about replication. And I would say all this uh, aspect of taking data from a database over to search index, another database, a data warehouse, a cache, I would uh, summarize all that as replication. But then there's other things. So for instance, you can use change their capture for propagating data between microservices. So typically in microservices architectures, you would like to have one database per service. You don't want to share a database between multiple services, but still those services, they don't exist in isolation, right? They need to exchange data. And as we will see later on, um, CDC can uh, be means of doing that.
audit logs. That's another very interesting one. Oftentimes you have this kind of business requirement where you need to keep track of the history of your data as it changes. And well, those CDC events, if you keep all of them, we have sort of an audit log, right? So really the sky's the limit and you can do all kinds of interesting things with a CDC. Debezium, as I mentioned, is one particular open source implementation. Of that, there's others, but, but um, now I'm most familiar with Debezium. And really, we try to be an entire CTC platform. So there's things like snapshotting, which is about taking the initial set of data uh, and uh, essentially uh, send you a dump over to your sync system. So we will talk about later uh, in more depth about that. There's uh, a user interface, and um, there's uh, things like filtering and all kinds of stuff. So really, it's a complete. Um, open source CDC platform, and it tries to address all those kinds of concerns you may have around CDC. It's open source, it's Apache licensed, and what I'm most happy about is there's a very active community. So um, as I mentioned before the talk, so even more than 350 people have contributed to Debezium at this point, so uh, there's quite a wide number of people, and it's Reddit engineers, but it's also other folks who work on connectors for Cassandra, for instance, for Vitesse, who drive the work there. So uh, it's really, it's a very diverse and active ecosystem. In terms of connectors, and now this is actually getting a little bit into the database space. So now there is the situation is there is no one single API or one single format which we could use to extract changes from all kinds of databases. So you cannot just implement the DBism connector and be done. Instead, what we need to do is we need to have a bespoke, a dedicated connector per database. And for each of those databases, we did the research. OK, so how do we get changes out of MySQL? How do we do it for MongoDB, all those databases? But then what we try to do is we try to expose those change events in a mostly uniform abstract way. So then for you as a consumer of those change events, you don't have to care really, does this event come from Oracle? Does it come from Postgres? And so on. MongoDB, that's a bit the exception because it's a document store. It's not a relational database. Um, so there, just by definition of how the database is designed, the event looks a bit different. But for all those other connectors, the event structure is quite quite uniform. I would say Mongo is different because like you can update within a, within a document without knowing what the whole document is. And if you, know, you, you need to know what the reference to the document is. But like, so I, I understand like, Parsing the log and handling that is different, but then the event that it emits, you're saying, is is fundamentally different than what like Postgres would put out. Yes, exactly. The the thing is, uh, well, uh, most notably, uh, MongoDB is a uh, schema-less store, right? So within a particular collection, I don't know, of, of customers, of purchase orders, and so on. At least in theory, all the events could be different. Typically, they will share a common structure, right? Your customer documents they will look largely the same, but maybe you have different versions of your application, so there may be differences, and this is why. Those events for MongoDB, they are not uh, strongly typed. So in Kafka Connect, there's a notion of a type system, uh, which we will see actually a little bit later on, um, which gives you a schema. And this uh, schema then tells you, OK, this is the structure of that event. And in the case of MongoDB, because of that schemaless nature, essentially, we give you a stringified representation of that. And the schema is essentially part of, uh, you know, it's part of that string, so to say. So that's that's the main difference. All right, and now the nice thing of what I found pretty interesting is, um, so we built Debezium and we built uh, those connectors. And of course, we tried not to reinvent the wheel for each of those connectors. So what we did is we created a connector framework, which uh, tries to unify things for us. And I don't know, re um, uh, makes given functionality for us reusable, like, I don't know, the snapshotting stuff, or how do we go about uh, filtering and how do we go about message format uh, creations and all those kinds of things. So we build a framework for that. And if you add a connector to the Debezium project, it's uh, not too much work, I would say. So you really can focus on that part, which gets changes out of that particular database. Now, what's very interesting is that actually also other people outside of the Debezium community picked up that framework. So SillaDB uh, is uh, one uh, example for that. So they essentially built a Debezium-based connector, but it's not part of the Debezium GitHub project, the Debezium project, uh, or the Debezium um, website and anything. They do it completely on uh, the on their own premises, but it's still based on the Debezium connector framework. And uh, well, A, it gives them lots of things to reuse, but B, 
It also means that now if you use the SillaDB connector, again, this change event format will look very similar or the same really as uh, the format of all the other DBSIM connectors. And really, the thing is people have multiple databases, right? So there won't be any company which just have uh, Postgres, which just have Oracle. They all have multiple databases. So giving them change events which look the same for different databases, that's a big uh, plus because then they can simplify how they process those change events. They don't have to care for different formats. And this is why I guess the SillaDB guys picked up the Debezium framework. And I think that's a pretty cool thing. They did a blog post on our uh, blog, so you can read up more about it if you want. All right. So let's dive a little bit into the Debezium architecture then a bit more. And um, I won't, I won't give you too many details, but there's a few things which I want to call out. And the one is, um, well, it's all within the uh, Debezium architecture. It's uh, centered around this notion of change event sources, so CES for short. And now, um, essentially, there's two kinds of change event sources. One's, uh, one is there for snapshots, and we will come to that, which takes an initial state out of your data. So I symbolize this here with the select star from your tables. And then there's those streaming change event sources, which uh, with the on event handler here, and they react to data changes. So most of the databases and their CDC APIs, they are some sort of callback uh, APIs, which invoke some callback which we register whenever there's a change event. Um, so we have those um, those two kinds of uh, change event sources. The Debezium framework uh, is in business of orchestrating and coordinating between those sources. So typically once this initial snapshot is done, for instance, we want to continue with streaming. And now the thing is, uh, all this runs as part of the Kafka Connect framework. And the reason for doing that is Kafka Connect, for instance, allows us to scale uh, horizontally out in a Kafka Connect cluster. Now you might say, okay, reading from a transaction log, that's by definition a rather linear activity. So how do you scale out there? And I would um, mostly agree, but where we can, for instance, scale out is um, A, when it comes to, uh, again, stores like MongoDB, which uh, just um, give us multiple streams from, dif uh, from different replica sets, as they call it. So there we have a notion of uh, being able to scale out and parallelize. Um, and also, for instance, in case of this notion of uh, snapshotting, so we can, of course, run multiple selects, or we could, we don't do it yet, but we could run multiple snapshot selects against multiple tables concurrently. And again, then this connect framework with its notion of tasks, which can be shuffled around in a connect cluster, uh, will be useful. So that's essentially why we run on Kafka Connect. Now, the thing is Kafka Connect itself, it's polling based. Um, so it will uh, not use callbacks, but it polls, which means we essentially, as most of our source APIs are callbacks, we need to go through this kind of blocking queue, which, uh, well, at least gives us some, some means of back pressure. Um, so we fill up this queue um, and when it's full, well, we cannot proceed with any f further change events from the database, so we would block. And then Kafka Connect will pull and consume those events out of this blocking queue for us, and it will send them off to, uh, to Kafka. So that's a little bit the um, internal architecture. I'm just mentioning it because there's this kind of mismatch which we have between those push-based source APIs and this polling-based Kafka Connect API, which creates a little bit of friction, but um, well, we can uh, work with it, um, but I thought it might be interesting. So then let's zoom out a bit again, and uh, let's uh, shortly talk a little bit about different ways of running and operating Debezium. So I was mentioning Kafka Connect a lot. So again, Kafka Connect, it's a framework which is part of the Apache Kafka umbrella. And I would say 90% of our users are using Debezium via Kafka Connect. So that's uh, the most common way. But we do have two more ways of uh, using Debezium. And the first one is which we call the embedded engine. So Debezium is all written in Java. And this means you also can embed it into your JVM, your Java-based application as a library. And typically, um, users do that who have very specific requirements as, um, and, or maybe like, who want to react to change events uh, at a rather low level. So things like the Apache Flink CDC connectors. So they are based on the Debezium embedded engine and they use then Debezium programmatically to in, uh, ingest change events into their Java-based application. So that's the embedded engine. And then uh, what we also support is what's called Debezium server. 
and to be some server that essentially is a ready-made runtime, which is based on this engine and which in an overall architecture view fulfills the same role as Kafka Connect. So it's a process uh, environment for running the Debezium connectors. But unlike Kafka Connect, Debezium Server lets you take those change events and send them out to other kinds of messaging infrastructure. So we have um, adapters for things like Apache Pulsar, Google Cloud Pops Up, AWS Kinesis, Redis Streams. Um, by the way, the Redis guys are very active on that one. Um, and we try to really you know, bring the features and capabilities of Debezium to all kinds of users either whether they are on Kafka or on, on something else, but really we want to support the users um, whatever messaging infrastructure they, they use. So that's Debezium Server. And um, I would say this is uh, ramping up over time. So I've been, I've seen, I've seen more users uh, more and more lately, which are interested in this. Um, as I mentioned, Redis folks are very interested in this. So I would say there's definitely some, some uptake there. Maybe how much processing are you, is the, embedded engine actually doing per like per event like are you are you just you know deserializing whatever postgres or mysql generates and then converting it to the expected format and shoving it out or are you doing things like are you, you know are you waiting you know uh are you waiting to see the commit message from up from a transaction and then right. sending the event out yeah. Okay. So that's a very good question. So um, there is a notion of batching at play uh, because most of those uh, messaging infrastructures, they benefit if you send messages in batches rather than one by one. It's just uh, more efficient. So you can um, do that if this is um, supported by the particular sync. What currently is not happening is what you describe uh, we, uh, uh, that we would do some sort of buffering based on transaction boundaries. The reason is the transaction can become arbitrarily large, right? And we would have to somehow buffer all the events from one transaction within memory. Um, you could implement it, I guess, if you wanted to. Um, so we also give you events, uh, if you get them from the database, about transaction boundaries. So there is the ability to tell, okay, a transaction has started and a transaction has ended, but then you would have to go about yourself and implement this kind of, of um, buffering. Um, but yeah, we, actually, that's, a, that's very interesting because um, sometimes people would like to do that, right? They, they would like to hold back events and they would only like to see all of them once, they, once a particular transaction has uh, committed. So we um, provide basic beans for that, for, for allowing you to do it yourself, um, but it's not something which Debezium does at the moment. So that means, so like, right, so that means like, if there's a, if a bunch of changes, get rid of the right-ahead log, and then they, they get propagated through Debezium. Then, then the transaction aborts. You get the abort message, and then whatever's on the other side of Kafka. Or whatever, yeah, whatever no. Being... Typically, we only get changes from um, committed transactions. So, really, most okay. of those interfaces are designed in the way in a way that they only give us uh, committed transactions. There's uh, most notably Oracle is an exception. So actually there we need to implement this kind of buffering already because it could be transactions are rolled back. Um, yep. For that, we have the ability to um, spill over a cache, which we have to disk um, in case transactions become very large. That, that, that is my question. Thank you. All right, cool. Yes, so now I mentioned, uh, I spoke a lot about change events and I, I thought we should also discuss actually what is a change event and this is uh, how it looks like. And by the way, I should say here, this is a JSON based representation, but really what matters is this is the semantical structure. Of, so how is it structured? But then in terms of how is this um, serialized into Kafka, you can go about this in different ways because in Kafka or all those, uh, those infrastructures really messages typically are byte arrays. So it's your uh, responsibility to take the, or well, let's say it's a matter of configuration uh, to take that uh, semantical type structure and serialize it either into JSON as we see here or serialize it into Avro as the compact binary representation protocol buffers and so on. But focusing a bit on that semantical structure. So the core parts really are those before and after parts of a, uh, which are there in each change event. And they describe the old and the new state of a row. Um, 
So typically, well, in case of an update, you would have both of them. If this is an insert event, you would just have this after part. And if it's a delete event, you would just have this before part. And now within those two blocks, before and after, this is coming back to this notion of uh, type structure, really. This resembles the structure of the tables you're capturing. So for each table um, within your, uh, for each column within your captured tables, you would have a field within those blocks. Again, MongoDB being the exception, so there we would essentially give you a stringified representation of the changed parts or the entire document, really. Um, and it would not be uh, typed on the particular level here. So that's before and after. And then uh, in addition, there's some metadata, which gives you some, I don't know, information about the version name of the connector, the position in the log file, um, some unique identifiers. So you, you can create that like uh, from, I guess, transaction ID and LSN in this case, maybe the table. Sometimes we can get the query, which causes a change. So that can be very interesting. And then of course you have those, uh, this um, op identifier, which tells you what kind of event it is. And lastly, in timestamp. So that's how change events look like in general. All right. Sometimes you can get the query. Yes. Yeah, so for Oracle, uh, sorry, for, for MySQL, uh, there's an option where they, so you need to enable that in the database and then they will persist the query in the bin log and we can fetch it from there. So okay. that's pretty cool. But, but that doesn't do that. All right, so then let's talk a little bit about uh, this outbox pattern and uh, um, this problem of microservices data exchange. Um, and I'm bringing this up because I just see this um, is a very relevant problem. So the, the problem is people build microservices services architectures. And now what typically happens is a service when, I don't know, it has a REST API, it uh, receives a request for uh, placing a purchase order. And now it needs to update its own database. So we want a persisted purchase order. But then at the same time, you also would like to send a message to other downstream services. So let's say we have this order service, it should persist the purchase order in its own database. And then if we also want to send a message to the shipment service, let's say, so for fulfilling this order. And maybe you use Kafka for doing that. And now the thing is, those two things, updating this database and sending a message uh, to another service via Kafka, they cannot happen in an atomic fashion because, well, Kafka just cannot participate in distributed transactions. Um, and even if it could, I would argue it's not uh, desirable to do that. So really those two things are independent. And this means doing that is prone to inconsistencies, right? So we could end up in a situation where we have persisted the purchase order in the database, but then we lost the message which we wanted to send to the shipment service. Or maybe even worse, we sent that message to the shipment service and we told it, hey, uh, please fulfill that order. But then we failed to, uh, to persist that uh, order in our own database. And obviously this would be very bad. Now, this is what you shouldn't do, right? So I always tell people, friends don't let friends do dual rights. So that's what we call dual rights, trying to update those two resources without shared transactional guarantees. So what can we do instead? And, and well, if we cannot update multiple resources, we always can update a single resource. And this would be the uh, database of our order service. So what it does is it updates its uh, own local table. So let's say we have a model with an order table and an order line table. And then within the same transaction, so we have a local transaction boundary, uh, it will also insert a message into a table, which is uh, which we call the outbox table. And the purpose of this outbox table is just acting as a message relay, which uh, we consume via Debezium to take those messages and send them to other consumers. And now as all this happens as one uh, atomic transaction, well, we would either uh, do all of this, right? So we would persist on our message, our, our purchase order, and we would um, persist this outbox message, or we would roll back the entire thing and we wouldn't do any, any of that. Now, Debezium enters the picture, CDC, so we capture the changes. And now in this case, we only capture the inserts into this outbox table. So we don't care about the, um, uh, the other business tables. We just captured the inserts, the inserts into this outbox table. And we would take those events and send them to Kafka. Why do we have the separate outbox table? Well, it's essentially a means of separating our internal model from messages which we send to external consumers. So typically, I mean, you could capture the changes to those order and order lines tables and send those messages to your consumers, but then you would really expose the internal schema of your 
um, uh, table model. And depending on where you stand on those uh, things, it's something you may or may not want to do. Most of the times, people rather prefer that sort of abstraction. And now with this outbox table in the picture, they have a separate message contract, which they consciously would evolve, for instance, and which is independent of the internal model, which they then could uh, you know, refactor, rework as they would like. How could this outbox table look like? Um, so I like to think about it in terms of domain-driven design, where you have things like, or concepts like an aggregate, um, which, for instance, describes the type of uh, a particular um, data item. So our uh, aggregate here would be uh, purchase orders, customers, things like that. You have things like an aggregate ID, which uh, tell you, okay, that's the particular purchase order this is about. You have, um, you might have something like an event type, which allows it to differentiate different types of events which apply to one particular order. And lastly, you have this payload. And this payload, well, this could be really anything. It's, in this case, it's a JSON structure, but again, it could be anything. And um, you are in charge of creating that structure and evolving it independently from your internal table model. And there's a bit of bespoke support for, for that pattern in Debezium. So um, essentially, if you have such an outbox table and it adheres to a particular convention, then you can out of the box use that. And for instance, Debezium would then take care of routing the events from that outbox table into different uh, Kafka topics per event type. So the reason is, by default, you would get one Kafka topic per table. So you would end up with all the outbox events in a single topic, whereas typically you would rather probably have your order events in one table, in one topic, and your customer events in another. <coughs> Sorry. How do people typically implement this? Is it like, like I mean, you know how to use triggers, you can write the application code to do this. In practice, what do you see as the most common approach? Right, that's a good question. So yes, it's a it's a matter of your application design, how you go about it. So what I would recommend and what I also see is uh, doing it in terms of an event-driven approach. Um, so for instance, for this Quarkus stack, which um, I mentioned in the beginning, so you can think of it as an alternative to Spring Boot, essentially. Uh, there we have an extension for that Quarkus framework, which then would allow you essentially to emit uh, just um, an event in your application code. So there's an eventing API and you just say, okay, I would like to fire such an order outbox event. And then this extension takes care of persisting that in this uh, table structure. So it's really quite, quite lightweight actually. Now the thing is, um, so here we have this um, approach where we have this outbox table, but actually there's an interesting alternative uh, for implementing that pattern. And this actually comes back a bit to this question as well. Um, if you are in Postgres, in Postgres you have the ability to write messages straight to the transaction log. So there's a, um, an API called PG logical emit message. And this uh, function allows you to just emit an event to the transaction log. So you won't see anything of that in any table. It goes straight into the transaction log. And this is very cool for this particular use case of this outbox um, pattern and just you know using Postgres for sending messages elsewhere. Because now in this case, we also can capture those events and you see, this is how you would do this function call. So you say, should it be transactional, true or false? So in this case, yes, we want to be a transactional. So we want to you know, not uh, persist it if the transaction gets rolled back. Then there's uh, some sort of type. So in this case, I just say it's outbox, an outbox message. And then again, I have my message payload. And now the cool thing is, for instance, this Quarkus extension, it could be implemented also based on that particular API. And we wouldn't need a, a separate outbox table which would be nice for a reason. And this is, um, well, we don't need additional disk space for materializing this table, right? And also we don't need to think about housekeeping of the table because, well, once our Outbox messages have been sent, um, we need to delete them from the Outbox table, right? Whereas here, if we only ever have those Outbox messages in the transaction log, well, we don't need to think about the housekeeping ourselves. So that's why I think uh, this um, API on Postgres, it's a very cool thing for implementing something like the Outbox pattern. Do we even have like a callback mechanism to say, like in the out Outbox pattern, I send this message, go back and call delete and remove it? 
on, on the table? Uh, mm, kind of. So you would, uh, I, I, I will touch on that a little bit. So there's a, a notion of offset management, which allows us to tell, for instance, Postgres, okay, this is how far we have processed the messages from the log, but you couldn't really uh, tap into that. So it would have to be a sort of a separate process where I guess you would have to monitor the offsets which we have acknowledged, and then you would be able to delete everything up to uh, that point. So it would require a bit of logic. Clear, the thing like, is, this, yeah, like to be clear, like the outbox pattern also too is like it it's sort of like providing additional semantics about what the events are actually trying to capture. You don't necessarily have to do this if you want to take the Bezium, just point it at the the, the database. It'll get all the rights to right. every single table, and you propagate that. Yes. So yes, that's that's really um, essentially two alternatives you have, right? Um, and I would say it's a philosophical question: Are you fine with exposing your internal table structures and those raw change events? Or are you not fine uh, with that? So I would say it depends a bit on the use case. If you think about something like caching, where I would argue you exactly want your raw table structure to be reflected in the cache, I would say that's fine. If you have uh, this kind of inter-system message exchange, then I would probably say, okay, you would rather want to abstract it. Now, also, if you capture the raw events, you have some means in Kafka Connect, for instance, to do things like rename fields or change their types uh, and stuff like that. So you can um, you know, uh, uh, modify messages a bit and try to abstract some, some schema changes. But I would feel with this outbox pattern, it's definitely it's uh, more powerful. For instance, you also can, of course, uh, materialize an entire aggregate into a single event, right? Uh, if you think about this purchase order in a relational database, probably would have stored that in multiple tables. And there's like a one-to-end relationship between purchase order header and order lines. And then if you have those raw events, you need to think about combining those and materializing, let's say, a single document, which you can persist into Elasticsearch to present an entire search, uh, an entire purchase order. Whereas you can do all this easier, I would say, in application code using the, the outbox pattern. Thanks. Cool. And um, so, and yeah, uh, just briefly, another use case for this um, PG Logical Message API is um, providing auditing metadata. So as I mentioned, a CDC log, if you keep it, it's kind of like an audit log, but what you are missing typically is this additional metadata, which you often want to have, like what is the business user, right? So you don't care about the database user. You want to have some sort of business user who did the change, or maybe some sort of use case identifier, maybe some sort of, of uh, client timestamp, this kind of thing. And uh, typically you don't have that metadata in your actual tables themselves. And uh, whereas for the purposes of uh, an audit trail, you would like to have the metadata. Now, again, using uh, that uh, logical message API, we could, at the beginning of a transaction, we could emit, or your application could emit a message with that metadata where you would store that in whatever format you would like to. And then you could implement some small logic for um, processing the events in Debezium before you send them out to Kafka. So what you essentially would do is you would uh, react, you would wait for this kind of event um, to, to, to show up in the event stream. You would uh, then take that metadata, keep it uh, somehow in memory, and then you could essentially all the uh, change events which come in until this transaction has committed. So until you see a transaction commit event, and you would take that metadata and put it into those events. And now they would be uh, fully self-contained as far as that metadata is concerned. So um, again, I think that's a pretty cool use case. And if I had to ask, or if I could ask the future database architects, I believe having this ability or this facility to emit uh, events straight to the transaction log, I think that's very useful and a uh, very cool thing to have in a database. All right, so I got to look a bit at time. Uh, yeah, but I think very good. Um, so now I hope I could give you a bit of an understanding of what the BSM is, what CDC is, why I think it's very interesting. Very powerful. Now I would like to talk a little bit about some of the challenges which we had uh, while implementing this and also, of course, how we overcame them. And the first one is, well, this is, um, uh, this is how are those um, messages structured? And how can we reason about their schema? 
The thing is typically such a change event, and again, this is highly dependent on the database. Here's, here we see an event as it comes from MySQL. But those events tend to not be self-descriptive. So if you look at this, you cannot fully make sense out of this, right? So you see um, no table name, you see no column names. It gives you some hints. There's a table ID. It tells you which are columns, uh, which are contained, identified by indexes. Then you see those values. But just by looking at this event, you cannot reason what this is about. Um, and this, this means you need to have extra information <coughs> to fully interpret that event. Now, uh, one thought might be, OK, I could try and go to my database and just query for that um, schema of the table. So let, le let's leave aside the fact that we just have this table ID. So let's assume there, there was a table name and we would know which table this is about. Um, we could try and go to our database and uh, fetch the schema for it and then try to make sense out of that message here. The thing is, a schema can evolve over time, right? And all this is asynchronous, which means is, which means at the point in time when we receive this change event, um, the schema of the table might look different now than at the point in time when this event was created. So this event got produced or got persisted in the transaction log. A schema change happened, so maybe they renamed a column or they added a column, whatever. And now we get to process that event. If we go to the database and query for the schema of the table now, there would be a mismatch between uh, the schema which was in uh, place when this event was created and the schema as it looks like now. So we cannot do that. And the question is, how can we um, go about and doing uh, uh, obtaining that schema information? And now it depends a little bit on the uh, different connectors. The worst case uh, would be MySQL because what we have to do there is we need to parse the DDL events as they happen. So for each create table, alter table, and so on, we need to parse that so we know. Um, and those DDL elements, they are part of the um, change event stream it, as we receive it. You need to parse those events in order to know how do those table structures look like. And now I have given you an example here and you would say, okay, that's rather easy-ish to pass. I've used this antler parser generator, um, which I guess you have heard of, which makes this relatively simple. The thing is, the, those grammars tend to be very complex. So this is a very basic example of a create table statement. There could be all kinds of modifiers, flex and switches, which uh, attribute to that. And the thing is, we uh, don't uh, we cannot only pass the create table statement, but instead we have to support the entire um, MySQL secret grammar data. So for stored procedures and everything, because we uh, need to fully implement that grammar, right? You cannot uh, parse something just partially. Um, and now in particular, in case of MySQL, they also tend to evolve the grammar. So also in micro releases, they add new features and then very often we would get a bug report and we uh, and it says okay i have executed this particular ddl statement and dbs and couldn't parse it so that's quite quite challenging and i would say it's not the most ideal way for conveying that schema information there is different ways and we will see what makes the life a little bit easier for us but so that's the one thing we need to pause it so we can build up some internal in memory model of the data. And then if the schema, if the change events come in, then we know, okay, this is the structure uh, and this is how this event looks like. Now there's another challenge and this is such a connector um, can be restarted at any point in time, right? So maybe you update the connector version, you update your uh, Kafka connect cluster, Maybe, I don't know, you just want to shut it down for a reason and don't run it. Now, what means is this connector gets restarted and now we need to still somehow uh, re-establish uh, this uh, schema. And now we have parsed those DDL events um, the last time the connector was running. So we need to persist that information somehow. So when we get restarted, we know uh, how this schema looks like. And this is why we have this notion of a schema history topic or database history topic. And essentially, this is how the Debezium connector persists the schema history in a special Kafka topic. And then if the connector gets restarted, we can reread this entire topic from the beginning to reload that state. And so we know um, what is the schema of that database. There's quite some subtleties around this because uh, what you need to keep in mind is in Kafka and Kafka Connect, you typically have what's called 
at least once semantics. So for instance, those offsets, they are not stored and persisted after each and every record, but instead this happens every now and then in intervals for the sake of efficiency. So this means um, we may process some events um, a second time if a connector gets restarted and maybe it crashed and it couldn't persist it, its offset correctly. And this is why if we, uh, when we reload this history, we need to be careful of how far do we reload it and so on. So it's quite, quite tricky. And um, I'm saying all that because I feel there should be a better way for, uh, for doing all that. And I would say um, Postgres is doing actually a pretty good job. And the idea they have is, well, um, we want to make our messages efficient, so they should not be fully self-descriptive uh, all the time. So something like JSON, which has the field names in each and every message, that would be very inefficient. But instead, what they do is they uh, essentially, when we start a session or a connection, they will give us a message which describes the schema for all our tables. And then again, when there's a, a schema change, they will also give us a message uh, which describes the new structure of that schema. And this uh, message is uh, not DDL, which we need to parse, but it's a structure, typed structure, which we can properly interpret easily. And uh, this allows us to um, build up an in-memory model of the table schema, and then when, uh, whenever those change events come in, we can go to our in-memory model and um, interpret them accordingly. So I would say really that's a good way of thinking about this. So providing um, you know, this information once so we can consume it, provide it in a easy to, easy to consume way, and um, so we don't have to deal with all the parsing and uh, keeping track in a separate topic and so on. Um, so that's, that's, I would say, pretty useful. So, and what also uh, would be useful? Yeah, sure. Hey, so I guess uh, many question or like uh, just a thought as an alternative to parsing, were you able to be able to just apply the DL, DDL statements to like a fake or like minuscule DBMS instance and like query the schema directly by component? <laughs> That's an interesting thought. Um... I guess we could. Um, I haven't thought about that, uh, but it's actually a pretty cool idea because we make it much You already need to query easy. it by SQL, right? Like you already need to query it at some point to build up your in-memory like uh, idea of what it looks like. All right. Yeah, so uh, that could actually work. So I would have to think about the details a bit, um, but this is an interesting approach. Thanks for bringing this up. That's, that's cool. I think that could work actually. All right, cool. So then um, let's keep going. And I'm looking a bit at the time here. Um, yeah, just on this notion of efficiency, um, so another thing which is a bit, uh, you know, which can be easy or hard for us is uh, how do those change events look like? So now, for instance, in case of Oracle, where we query this um, log miner view, which they have, this is actually how we get change events from there. So let's say you up, you execute that update statement at the top. This will result in a event in this log miner view, which looks like uh, at the bottom. So it's in Gener uh, generated update event, uh, which essentially you know tells us about the changed fields, and in the where clause it tells us about the old values of the entire row. And now that's I would say rather uh, inconvenient way for telling us about that information, right? Because again, we need to parse that. Here we cannot use until actually because it's just too slow. So we have an optimized hand built parser for parsing just those. Um, uh, DML events, but really it would be so much easier if we got a typed structure as it is the case for Postgres or all the other connectors really. So again, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, give us, uh, it, it's always better to have properly typed uh, structures instead of uh, having to pass that sort of information that, that uh, makes life much easier. All right. So I will skip that part because um, uh, I, I feel I'm running a little bit out of time. Um, so let me continue here, with, which is about snapshotting. And I should say a few words about that. So very, I mean, essentially Debezium is in the business of capturing changes from the transaction box. And this is why people are excited about it. At the same time, there often is this requirement to do some sort of initial backfill of your data. So you want to start, let's say you take this data into your search index or you, into your OLAP system. You want to have the complete 
data set there, right? So you can run uh, the, uh, your queries on the entirety of your data. Now, the problem is you typically don't have the uh, transaction logs from the beginning of time on your operational database. So typically, once the database figures out those transaction logs are not needed any longer for transaction recovery and so on, they will be discarded, which means if our database has been running for a while and we set up Debezium, we don't get or we won't be able to get all the information just by looking at the transaction logs. Instead, we also need to look at the current state of the tables and essentially query them for getting this initial um, view of the data. So that's uh, what this notion of snapshotting is about. And here I'm just showing you as a pseudo code really how this would work in case of the Debezium Postgres connector. So what we do there is we create a replication slot. And the replication slot, that's the means or let's say one um, uh, logical um, entity for getting changes out of uh, a Postgres database. Um, so it has a name, Debezium in this case, um, and we specified this export snapshot parameter. And this one essentially, um, well, as it says, it exports a snapshot ID. So now this means we can start another transaction as we see on the next line. And there we tell, okay, this snapshot ID, 3A1-1, uh, this should be used as the point in time where we would like to look at the data. So now this means we can take a snapshot at the very point in time, or I, I should say at the very offset in the transaction log where uh, we created that replication slot. Which means now we can run our select queries for taking the initial data. And this could, of course, be parallelized, as I said. And then we can commit or even roll back to that snapshot transaction. And then we would continue to read from that um, replication slot, which we created initially. And this allows us to have a seamless transition from doing that snapshot transaction to reading the log. Um, this is how it works for Postgres. It works like that for Oracle. For other connectors of other databases, it's not as easy because we don't have means of uh, getting that exact transition point. So for instance, for MySQL, what we need to do is we need to take a lock for a very short uh, period of time, essentially where we prevent any writes to the database. So just we can essentially uh, identify what's the current offset in the transaction lock. We can start our retransaction, then, then it will allow writes again. But uh, well, also, although this is a very short uh, lock, which we need to hold, people just don't like it, right? People don't like write locks, uh, no matter how short they are. So um, that's why doing something like that, which gives us this ability uh, to, you know, start this uh, snapshot transaction uh, at the same point in time where we will read the transaction log later on, that's very convenient. Oracle has the same with its notion of select S of SCN. So that's that's really cool. And I think it's a very good thing to have in a database. Now, the thing is with those snapshots, so we had them in Debezium from the beginning, I would say. But there, at the same time, there's a few shortcomings. So for instance, you cannot update what's called the filter list. So typically, people would only like to capture some tables. They don't want to capture all the tables. Um, they just would like to capture a subset of the tables. Now, the thing is, once a connector has done a snapshot, um, it's hard to update that filter list of the tables you are interested in capturing. Because um, if you think about it, so now you need to take a snapshot of those new tables which have been added to your filter list, whereas you want to keep the transaction log read uh, running somehow, so that, quite get, get, that gets quite complicated. It never was supported in Debezium. Also, you couldn't pause and resume a snapshot. So depending on the size of the data, it can run for quite some time. And if it, for whatever reason, was interrupted, um, you had to uh, restart at the beginning. Also, you couldn't... Um, uh, start with streaming your changes until the snapshot had uh, been completed. So quite a few shortcomings. And um, luckily, uh, we came across a very nice um, alternative implementation of snapshotting, which I would like to discuss a little bit. And this is credit where credit is, is due. This is created or uh, was um, described by, now I, I hope I get the names right, Andreas Andriakis and Ioannis Papapanagiotou from Netflix. So Netflix team, they built their own CDC implementation. They said they would open source it, but it hasn't happened so far. So they mentioned this in 2020 or 2019. I haven't seen it so far, 
But what they did is, and I'm very thankful to them for that, is they open, they described this innovative snapshotting algorithm in this paper, which everybody can read. So you got the URL here. And the idea there is they interleave the events as they read them from the transaction log with events from the uh, which they take from snapshot transactions. And I will tell you a little bit um, about how this works. Again, all the credit goes to those guys who did this very useful work. We adapted this a little bit and implemented this in Debezium. But real, the idea is from the Netflix guys. So how does it work? Well, again, the idea is they we run those two activities in parallel. So we read from the transaction log and we also read uh, our snapshot data. Now, instead of one single large select for an entire table, we do this in chunks. We do it in chunks um, because well, we want to essentially make this, uh, you know, we want to portion this work and make it interruptible. So for that, what we need to do is, um, and I just uh, focus on one table here, customer. So this needs to be ordered. Um, so that's why I'm ordering it uh, by ID. And I'm getting event the snapshot rows in chunks of size 1,000. So it could be a configurable, of course. So if I start with ID 1, and I get the first 1,000 uh, ones. Next chunk transaction would be uh, could start at thousand and one, or maybe if I had you know um, if some IDs were missing, I would start at larger offset, but I would get the next thousand and so on. So this of course requires that our table has a primary key; it must be orderable so that we can do that chunked approach for selecting data. So now, if you just were doing that, there would be a problem, of course, and the problem is those two things. Um, getting those snapshot chunks and reading from the transaction log, those uh, two things can collide. So what could happen is we select something from this customer table. At the same time, an update comes into one of the records which uh, was uh, returned by that select, and we might override that update event from the transaction log with the old state which we selected uh, via the select statement. So we need to prevent that, of course. And that's where this cool idea of watermarking comes into picture into the picture so the idea is uh, to tie together uh, those chunk transactions for the snapshotting and the corresponding parts of the transaction log and the idea how it works is to insert um, records into a specific table let's call it the signals table so if we get to a new chunk of our trans of our snapshotting let's say here the first 1000 First, we would insert a low watermark into the signals table, which then will show up in the transaction log, of course. Then we run our chunk query, so we get a thousand customer records, and then we insert another signal record, the high watermark, which essentially demarcates the end of this window. And what we achieve by that is we couple together one snapshot chunk, which gives me a thousand customers, and a corresponding uh, section of the transaction log. And now we can go, as we have correlated those two things, we can go and resolve those conflicts, which I mentioned before. So let's take a look into one of those chunks. Let's say this is uh, what happens. So I have here my snapshot query, and it, ret uh, it returns me seven rows, key one, key two, key three, and so on. And I name those snapshot events, I name them read events. So that's the R. Uh, that the R stands for. And at the same time, I uh, is at the beginning, I inserted that uh, low watermark. And then other changes come in. Of course, other transactions can be running. So I would see an update to key two, an insert to key eight, update to key four, delete to key one, and so on. And then this high watermark gets captured. And this demarcates the end of that window. And now those two things, those updates between the low watermark and the high watermark, and those records which I retrieved from my snapshot chunk query, they um, correlate, or they belong together, I should say. And of course, now we need to resolve uh, those conflicts or uh, essentially remove anything uh, which has been selected in the snapshot chunk because everything which came in from the transaction log that should actually have precedence. So the way it would look like is, so now, for instance, this uh, key one, um, it got... Uh, deleted, right? So um, um, in the transaction log. So that's why I discard that event from my snapshot chunk buffer. So by the way, of course, I need to read this into some sort of buffer before I stream it out. So I discard key one, I discard key two because this got updated. I keep key three because there was no change to key three in that window. So I keep that uh, in the snapshot buffer. I discard key four 
because it got updated. Five and six, they were not changed, so I keep them. And key seven was uh, also updated, so I discard them. And now, once I have reached that high water mark, I do that uh, um, uh, discarding, which I described. And now, what I would do is I would is just emit all the remaining uh, snapshot rec uh, records. So key three, key five, key six. And if you take a step back, what all this achieves is we get a backfill of all our data um, by stepping through those chunk uh, steps while the transaction log is uh, consumed. And if you think about it, um, I know it's, it's, it's probably quite dense for a short period of time, but again, this paper describes it. We have a blog post which describes it. But if you think about it, it gives you some interesting semantics. So they are a bit different than what uh, we did in the classic snapshotting. So for instance, what is not guaranteed is that you would get a snapshot event for each and every uh, of those records because this deduplication happens, right? What uh, If there is uh, this chunk transaction running for a particular subset of our data, and at the same window, we get an update or a delete event, they would take a precedence. So we would not get all the snapshot events, but then we would get update events or we would get a delete event. What also could happen is we may receive an update event um, and we didn't see an insert event before, which is fine because those events are fully uh, self-contained. They have the full state, right? And lastly, you may uh, also receive read and update events at the same time. So let's say um, I had that state in the transaction log, and now I would, for whatever reason, read key uh, um, key four in the next snapshot chunk. Well, then I would first have gotten this update from that window here, and I would get the key four select event from the next window. So essentially, what all that means is I need to think a little bit different about those events. So I should essentially just apply absurd semantics if I were to take the data and propagate it into some sync system, for instance. I would just make sure um, if I get an event, I either update the state if I have that key already or I insert it. What is guaranteed for me is um, once this incremental snapshot has been finished, then I will have a complete set of my data. So, and that's the key requirement which we want to have, right? We want to have the full set of data in our sync system. And this is what we get. Now, if you compare that a little bit to that original shortcomings, well, all those things are not a problem anymore because, well, I can update my filter list. Um, I can just do it. And then I can take an, an, a snapshot of all the newly captured tables um, by running this incremental snapshot. I can pause and resume those uh, um, incremental snapshots because what we also do is, for all those, or for each chunk query, or let's say for the latest chunk query, we persist the uh, last primary key which we've seen. We persist that in the connector offsets, and this means if the connector gets restarted, then we know from where to continue. What is the next chunk query to execute, and we can resume with that snapshot. And also, um, well, by definition of that algorithm, we don't have to wait until the snapshot has been completed before the streaming starts, because those two, those two things um, happen at the same time. What I should also mention is um, now all this requires write access to our data, because we need to insert those low and high watermark um, um, marker events. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And also currently how this is triggered is by another insert. So the way you talk to the BSIM essentially is through the signals table and we will capture that command from the transaction log eventually. For MySQL, we have a way for doing it with read-only transactions. I don't have the time to talk about it, but um, I just want to bring attention to that. And that's pretty much all I had. And I know we are a bit over already, but um, I want to quickly just wrap up. So I hope I could bring across that uh, CDC is a very powerful tool. So there's lots of use cases for it. It's really a very flexible tool in the box. And my personal wish would be that it becomes a part of all the databases. So like we have, as we have select and insert and updates and deletes today, I would really love to see if there also was just native built-in support into SQL, into databases, maybe using a stream keyword or whatever, but it shouldn't be an afterthought. So maybe I guess you have seen a little bit 
you kind of get the feeling CTC always has been an afterthought, right? It, it wasn't the first class um, element of, of uh, the design goals, I would say. And I would love this uh, to change. And actually, this is changing. So if you look at newer databases like Yugabyte or CockroachDB, um, they have OscillaDB, they have CTC interfaces from the get-go. So for them, it's not an afterthought because they understand having that low latency capability of pushing changes to users is super powerful and super um, flexible and, and, and just very interesting to have. Debezium is a implementation of CDC for a variety of databases, as we have seen. It's all open source, as I mentioned. Um, and lastly, just go, go, I'm just going to mention this keyword. What also would be super interesting to see incrementally updated materialized views. Uh, so I believe you had somebody from Materialized IO here. Uh, if not, you should definitely. Um, so, and there's other projects in that space which not only give you incremental updates to your raw data, but also to materialized views, which of course takes it to the next level because then we uh, get insight, incremental insight into complex query results. And I believe that's a very interesting topic um, where I would love to see definitely more development. And lastly, a few resources. Um, so if you would like to know more about Debezium, there's our website, Debezium.io. Um, this incremental snapshotting algorithm, I believe I did not do it fully justice with the short description. You can read about it more either in the original Netflix paper or in the blog post, which we have here. We have this article about the outbox pattern. And lastly, which I would really recommend you, we have a large demo repository where you can find all kinds of examples and demos for using Debezium for different purposes. So definitely check out this demo repository and uh, take a look at what's there. And with that, any, I'm not sure whether we still have time for taking questions. I'm, I'm happy to take them, um, but that's all I had in any case. I, I applaud on behalf of the audience. Uh, then we'll take one question from the audience. Sure. <laughs> if, if everyone wants to fire away. Cool. Oh, I have a question. Okay, cool. Um, Me had a question in chat. Oh. oh, sorry, there's a question. Sorry. Uh, Habib, go for it. Am I on? Yes, you're, you're on. Go for it. Okay. So I'm going to make this one two parts because I only said only one question. <laughs> so one thing is that about <laughs> materialized views, uh, when the aggregate functions are not algebraic, so when a, anything in the group changes, we have to have access to all the rows of that group to go recompute it. Right. And it's not incremental. So that is more than what the replication can do because I have to access the original one too, you know, because the... <laughs> Did yes, that's a very good uh, uh, good point. So you, you would either have to keep that state somehow in your aggregation state or you would have to go back. That's, that's yeah, true. Yeah. I, I believe for materialized IO, they keep everything in memory currently. Yeah, because some of these groups are very really large, actually, if the, the, the group on, uh, on, the cardinal, on the column with a very low cardinal. Absolutely, yeah. So that's one. The other one is that uh, when we do the replication and we have like uh, target is also OLTP and we have referential integrity there, we have to be very careful about the timing between the replication of the tables involved in this such constraints, any kind of input table constraints. Yes. So that is buffering, right? Because you can't just exactly. apply because the parent is not there until the parent is right. not in there. So, yes, it, it, that's 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 perfectly right. So um, you know, some people typically, if, let's say, if you think about data warehouse OLAP, you would have some sort of data landing area where you keep the raw events right, and you will resolve a referential integrity later on. Um, what you can do is um, some means of stream processing, like Flink or Kafka streams, which would give you some windowed uh, notion of uh, joining, which uh, help in that case. Um, but yes, you are totally right. If you uh, consumed events uh, one by one, you wouldn't, in particular, you would not have ordering guarantees between the events of different tables. That's definitely right. Yeah, so that's a major problem with this. And we have to do that correctly when we do between the OTPs, which IBM has, of course. Um, so we have to, that's a tricky thing to do. Absolutely, yeah. Do have, the resume does not do that. It does not do that at the moment. That's true because we really focus on that sync side of the of the story. Um, we may evolve into that space, and then we would uh, try to reason about it. Um, absolutely. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thanks. So, Good uh, question for sure. So my last question is, I mean, sort of related, depending on 
Depending off of what Hamid said, right? So Debitum, as far as I know, from my perspective, it's the most popular CDC framework, open source CDC framework. But as I said, there's Golden Gate, there's Talend. Uh, I don't know what the IBM one is. I'm sure you guys got one. But like, what is there something about? Is there one sort of feature that these other commercial uh, proprietary CDC frameworks have that like Debitum doesn't have? You wish you had it. So who, are you asking me? Uh, yeah, I guess. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the thing is, I generally try to not focus too much on the on the competition. Um, but yeah, so let's say uh, for sure having a native uh, Oracle mining engine, that would be very interesting to have, absolutely.